Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Tracy Johnson, and I have the honor of serving as the Dean of the Division of Life Sciences here at UCLA. And I'm also a professor in the Department of Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology, where my lab studies fundamental mechanisms of how genes get turned on and turned off at the right place at the right time. And uh, some of that is relevant for the discussion we're gonna have this evening. So during my tenure as Dean, since the fall of 2020, I've really been excited about highlighting the amazing research and the accomplishments in all of the departments within life sciences. And today I welcome you to our Let's Talk Science lecture series hosted in the division, where we highlight UCLA's research expertise on some of today's most pressing problems. And we really look at critical scientific questions from a variety of perspectives that are represented well within the division. So first I'd like to share a little bit about uh, the Division of Life Sciences. We've grown to be the academic home of the largest number of undergraduates of any school or division at UCLA. And it's something that we're very proud of. Um, I'm particularly proud of the fact that we do that. We teach very well, we support our students, but that's not all we do. Our faculty are figuring out how to address mental health on a massive scale, helping us understand how to address the effects of climate change on the environment. And relevant for today, our research faculty are developing new ways of treating chronic diseases like cancer, immune disorders, sickle cell disease, and genetic disorders of all kinds while addressing pressing needs such as disease tracking and vaccine development. We're on the cutting edge of some of the most important research problems. And this is just a taste of the work that we do in life sciences. A common theme is that our faculty and students share the goal of using science to solve society's most urgent challenges. So in today's event, Innovative Therapies from Bench to Bedside, we're gonna hear about how UCLA is conducting basic bench and cutting edge translational bench to bedside research, uh, leading to better diagnostics as well as treatments for disease. So this evening, you're going to hear from three of our esteemed professors who will discuss their research and the implications on innovative therapies uh, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, bioengineering collaborations to better target tuberculosis, and gene therapy to potentially reverse sickle cell disease. And following the presentations, I will join them to pose your questions. And so we're excited to take questions from the audience, uh, which you can submit through the Q&A feature that's at the bottom of your screen. And please feel free to submit those questions at any time. Uh, please note also, though, that the chat will be turned off. So your questions should come through the Q&A. And, uh, and I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to be in this conversation with you tonight. So it is my pleasure to introduce the first of the three faculty who will be speaking with us this evening. I'm pleased to introduce you to Dr. Donald Cohn. So Dr. Cohn is a distinguished professor in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology and Molecular Genetics, Pediatrics and Molecular Medical Pharmacology. He's a member of the Broad Stem Cell Research Center, the Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center and UCLA's Children's Discovery and Innovation Institute. Dr. Cohn's research program focuses on gene therapy using hematopoietic stem cells, performing basic studies of gene transfer and expression, and then translating these findings to clinical trials of gene therapy for congenital immune deficiencies, sickle cell disease, and other uh, blood cell diseases. Dr. Cohn began working on gene therapy as a fellow at the National Institutes of Health in 1985, and then began practicing as a pediatric bone marrow transplant physician at Children's Hospital Los Angeles in 1987. He relocated to UCLA, fortunate for us, in 2009, where his clinical practice is limited to inpatient service on the Pediatric Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation Unit at Mattel Children's Hospital in the Ronald Reagan Medical Center here in Westwood. Dr. Cohn's group was the first and still the only one to perform a clinical trial with gene transfer to umbilical cord blood, CD34 positive cells for a genetic disorder, um, SCID, in 1983. And the first in the US to initiate clinical trials of gene therapy for pediatric HIV AIDS using bone marrow stem cells. He directs a large research program performing bench-to-bedside research 
on gene modification of blood forming stem cells and has brought his research to multiple clinical trials. He's actively involved in training undergraduates, graduate students, and medical students, as well as PhD and MD fellows. And I will say you will be impressed with his science, which is extraordinary. And i am just remind you that that's coupled with him being really an exceptional mentor and educator. So it's with my um, sincere pleasure um, that I get to introduce you to Dr. Donald Cohn. Well, thank you, Dr. Johnson, uh, for that very nice introduction. Um, I'm going to talk a little about the work that we do, and let's see if I'm in the right uh, mode. Um, okay, I hope that's right. Um, so I'm going to talk about our work, and as Dr. Johnson said, hematopoietic stem cell, which is a fancy word for blood forming stem cells for blood cell diseases. Um, and so we start with the blood. And so uh, we all kind of know what blood is. And this is a, a cartoon diagram showing that blood is basically a group of cells, red blood cells, white cells, and platelets that are in a protein rich liquid plasma. And these circulate and do very many important things for us. And if we look at blood sort of in a different perspective, if we take some blood and we spin it in a tube, we can see that about 45% of it is red blood cells. Small amount are the white blood cells and platelets, and the rest of it is the plasma. So all of these blood cells are, are obviously very important to our, our life. They're all made in the bone marrow and after we're born from stem cells. And so this is the, the concept of stem cells as a cell that can continually replace itself. So stem cells split in two, making new stem cells, or they can start changing and grow up to become adult types of blood cells. So on the right are the types of blood cells that we see in, in the blood. And in the bone marrow every day, our stem cells are turning out billions of red blood cells, white cells, and platelets. These cells, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, are actually present in the baby's circulation at the time they're born, so they can be captured from their cord blood. Clinically, most commonly, we actually mobilize the stem cells from the bone marrow into the blood to get them. And so transplanting these cells, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, can cure a whole list of genetic diseases of blood cells. And this is really a partial list. And so at, at the top are a group of primary or inherited immune deficiencies. And I'll, I'll talk today about severe combined immune deficiency or SCID. There's many other diseases that we can treat by giving the patient new stem cells from a brother or sister that can make the missing blood cell. More commonly, there are these red blood cell diseases, sickle cell disease, and thalassemia, where patients either make abnormal red cells or not enough red cells. And again, because those are made from the stem cells, we can treat them with a stem cell transplant from a healthy donor. And there's some other diseases where also we can replace the stem cells to make new blood cells treat diseases. But one of the limits that we face in clinic in my work is doing bone marrow transplant are the immune barriers between people. So we think about that uh, if a patient gets an organ transplant, the recipient can reject the donor's T cells. But in bone marrow transplant, we also can have the, the flip side occurring that T cells from the donor in the new patient's body can reject it. So we call that graft versus host disease, where the grafted cells attack the host. And clinically, as a transplanter, that's one of the main problems we deal with when the donor cells are attacking the patient. We have to give immune suppression. So that really increases the risks of complications. So the work that I do is basically trying to get around that doing gene therapy would use the patient's own stem cells that we correct in the laboratory to have the, the gene that they're missing. And by giving those back, it avoids these complications. So that's sort of our, our, our basic hypothesis that using the patient's own cells will be safer. And so then our, our sort of our engineering task is that we have to make the gene normal, this early stem cell, if they have a permanent effect. All these other blood cells beyond that only last for weeks to months and would go away. And so we had to learn over the years and, and progressively, again, bench to bedside and back again, we've gotten better at, at changing the genes in these cells. And so the way that I'll talk about mainly today is adding good copy of the gene using a virus. Then more recently, we're also actually learning how to edit the genes right in the genome. And some of you have heard about CRISPR, and I'll mention how we can use that to actually fix the genes in the stem cells. And we use a marker that's on these early stem cells, CD34, to enrich these cells out of the bone marrow. 
And so this, this slide shows sort of what the process is. So we start with a patient and we collect some of their blood stem cells, either from their bone marrow or by moving them into the bloodstream. And then in the laboratory, we've cloned the gene that's missing for that patient into a virus that can actually bring that gene to the stem cell and put it into the chromosomes, the DNA of that stem cell. So it's now permanently modified and all the daughter cells that it makes will inherit that information. Or we can use a different method to actually gene edit the cell and either add a gene or fix a gene. Then before we give the cells back, we often give the patient some chemotherapy to get rid of some of the remaining uncorrected stem cells in their body. So when we give these back that we've, we've fixed, they take over and make all the blood cells. And so this is then sort of a diagram again of that process. So we see in the upper left, a patient having their blood stem cells collected and you can see she's awake and talking to the nurse. So it's not a very difficult procedure to go through. Then those stem cells are taken to the, the good manufacturing practice or clean rooms. And so on campus, we have a series of laboratories that are of the, the level for making pharmaceuticals. And so people working there wear spacesuits as you're seeing here. And we then take the stem cells, we isolate the, those stem cells we want with that marker. We put them into culture for two days and we add the virus that I talked about, or we edit the cells to correct it. And then we typically now we freeze the cells down and hold them in liquid nitrogen until we've done all the testing to make sure that they're sterile, they took up the gene and a number of other properties. And when we know that the cells are good, then the patient comes in to get the transplant. And the transplant is actually the easiest part of it because we don't have to give the cells right back into the bone marrow. We can just run them into the, into the bloodstream intravenously and they'll make their way back to the bone marrow. And so the disease that I mentioned that, I'll, that I'll, I'll talk about today is a disease called severe combined immune deficiency. Um, and SCID uh, is the most severe human immune deficiency where patients basically are born without any T and B cells, which are the main cells that fight off viruses and other infections. And it's a relatively rare disease. The estimate's about one in 58,000 patients. So it's about 100 kids a year in the US are born with SCID. And before there were treatments, this was uniformly fatal in infancy before there were treatments because the patients would get an infection, even just a common cold virus will be fatal to these patients. And some of you may know about, there was a boy in Texas in the 70s who was kept alive in a sterile sort of bubble. It was, so this is sometimes called bubble baby disease, but we don't do that anymore. We, we typically will give them a bone marrow transplant from a donor. And if they, which was first done in 1968, if they're fortunate enough to have a brother or sister who is a perfect match for the human leukocyte antigen, for the tissue antigens, chances of success are quite high. And the stem cells from the donor will go to their bone marrow and make blood cells for the patient and replace the T and B cells. The problem is most people don't have that match brother or sister. It's only one in four with the same parents. So most of the time we have to use less well matched either an unrelated donor like through those registries that some of you may have been typed for, or we've learned how to take bone marrow from a parent, it's only a half match and we can use those, but they're somewhat less successful. So that's the group of patients that we've targeted our gene therapy for, those that don't have a brother or sister who's a, a perfect match. And uh, this is just a, a very busy slide to show that we've been at this for a long time. As Dr. Johnson mentioned, I began this work as a fellow in the mid eighties, this is sort of our lifetime number of patients we've treated. And so we did actually a trial uh, back in 93 using the cord blood stem cells from three newborns with ADA skid. And then over the years, we improved our process. We went through various trials. We moved across town. And I'll tell you about the most recent iteration of this using a, a virus that worked very effectively. And uh, at the end of 2017, 2018, we actually licensed this out to a company and didn't treat any patients in, in the in, interim. And then just most recently, we're, we're back in business. And so th these are some photographs from the day a, a patient is getting gene therapy in the Hotel Children's Hospital. And so on, on the left, you see this liquid nitrogen tank is what transported the frozen stem cells from the laboratory to the patient's bedside. And then the middle is, is, is Nurse Lindsay with a bucket with every tube and connector we might need to connect the stem cells to the patient's IV line. And then on the right, you can see that the stem cell in, in this bag have been thawed. So you can see the liquid level and that little bit of fluid with a little bit of cloudiness, that's the stem cells that are gonna make blood for the rest of this patient's life. So here is a patient getting gene therapy. And so he has an IV line sort of into his, the vein in his elbow. And this cloudy tube on the left are the stem cells. 
The clear tube on the right is the saline that we'll flush it with. So just that little syringe full of stem cells that might have 50 to 100 million of these stem cells will be enough to repopulate his bone marrow with cells that we hopefully corrected with the gene. So um, in that last trial that we did between uh, 2013 and 2018, we treated patients from all around North America. So the arrows show where patients came. So besides being scientists and physicians, we also got to be travel agents and learned our Canadian geography. About a third of the patients came from Canada. And then we had one legendary patient who came from Lebanon who was very sick, arrived, was on a ventilator for two or three months, but now has been well for six, seven years since his treatment. And so as good scientists, we published our results uh, a year ago in New England Journal of Medicine. And we pulled in this paper studies that we did here at Mattel Children's at UCLA and that were done with our colleagues in London at Great Ormond Street Hospital. And Dr. Claire Booth was the lead investigator there. And so between our two uh, sites, we treated a total of 50 patients with ADA SCID in, the, in that last version in, in parallel trials. And we used the, the stem cells with a, a lengthy viral vector to insert the gene. And we gave the patients low dose of chemotherapy. And uh, just to sort of summarize very quickly, so we developed this at the two institutions together. And it took about four years from the idea of we should move to this next type of virus to being ready to open the trial. And so that, that was research done here in our lab and at the lab at Great Ormond Street Hospital, U University College London from research grants. So then I told you that we did this phase one, two trial with 50 patients and our results were really quite good. So 100% of the patients are alive and well to the present time and all but two of them. So 48 of them had really successful recover their immunity. Two of the patients that didn't work. Um, one of them, we don't know why, but the stem cells just didn't take. And one patient in London was kind of sick and didn't get a lot of stem cells given back. But the other 48 remain well. And in fact, our first patient was treated um, in August of 2013. So her 10 year anniversary is coming up. And these cells persist. So they're engrafted through these patients um, to the present time. So that's the very good news. So as I said, at that point, we recognize that you know, we've kind of proven this works. It needs to go to, to the FDA for a biological license approval so it can be marketed basically and sold as a drug. And so it was licensed then from our universities to a startup company or to therapeutics in 2016, but they really didn't get it done. And so about a year ago, they announced they were giving it back to our universities in part pressured by families waiting for this treatment. And so we've reopened trials now, uh, both in, in London and UCLA to treat patients. And those were the two that I showed you in th this year that we've treated two patients so far this year. And so this is just some pictures of some of our, our former babies who uh, their parents uh, very nicely sent us pictures the first day of school, Christmas, birthdays, transplant anniversaries. And I will just stop there and just show you our lab is over here in the Tarasaki building. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohn. That was really inspiring. And uh, it's just wonderful to see how understanding some of these really fundamental principles of how cells behave can lead to um, really transformative innovations. I'm sure we'll have a good time in our next conversation. So next I'm going to, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Carrie Maselli. So Dr. Maselli is a professor in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Molecular Genetics. And she's also the co-director of the Center for Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy here at UCLA. Uh, the Maselli Lab is focused around two main research areas, uh, T-cell biology and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or DMD. DMD is a, a lethal genetic disease of childhood. It's caused by mutations in uh, DMD, which encodes the dystrophin protein. So it's a very, very large gene, and those mutations lead to the disease. Combining her expertise in these areas, she's now focused on dystrophin replacement therapies and immune drivers of regeneration, fibrosis, and muscle tissue tolerance. In 2005, together with uh, Dr. Stan Nelson, Dr. Maselli developed a program designing and implementing cellular assays for high throughput small molecule screening for DMD drug discovery, which means a way of looking for new molecules that can target the disease. 
in 2007 with colleagues. Uh, she founded the Center for Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy here at UCLA to improve education, accelerating research, and promoting translation into the clinic for the most lethal genetic disease of childhood. The centers catalyzed new DMD team science, approaches to translational research, drug discovery, clinical trial development, and clinical care on campus and nationwide. So starting with this disease, what we're learning is really allowing us to have impact on other diseases. The center has successfully expanded the number of multidisciplinary collaborations that are focused on muscular dystrophy research and accelerated the discovery and testing of potential therapeutics with multiple labs on campus now working on Duchenne. There are a number of therapeutic strategies that are really now just poised to translate from the bench into the clinic for Duchenne. And the CDMD is committed to facilitating their development and delivery to patients. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Maselli. Thank you, Dr. Um, Johnson. Uh, today, I'd like to tell you all a little bit about Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's a progressive uh, muscle degeneration disease where fibro fatty uh, tissue replaces muscle tissue and leads to the progressive loss of um, skeletal and cardiac function. It's uh, usually diagnosed in early childhood with patients uh, missing their, their early milestones and with progressive muscle weakness, uh, boys transition to wheelchairs in their early teens due to loss of muscle function in their legs. And by their teens or 20s, they um, succumb usually to respiratory or cardiac failure. It's uh, present at one in 5,000 males, making it one of the most common rare diseases of childhood. So the first clinical and, and histological descriptions of DMD come in the 1800s. And even in the 18, by a, a number of folks, but including Dr. Duchenne, who is the namesake of, of, of the disease, in the 1800s, they had the wherewithal to describe and photograph boys with characteristic uh, phenotypes, as well as to document by microscopy and, and, and drawings and the like that indeed the disease was the result of replacement of the muscle with fat and fibrosis over time. So this is a modern day picture of, of uh, MRI showing basically the same thing. And that is that on the left, you can see uh, an MRI image of a boy with Duchenne at age 12. This is his thigh. And in the middle, you can see um, in the middle, you can see, uh, sorry, just get my pointer. This is a, a boy at, at 12 years old. Uh, the muscle is represented in red and the fat and fibrosis is represented in green. And you can see at 12 years old, his thigh has already lost a lot of its muscle uh, being replaced with the green fat and fibrosis. That continues to progress with more muscle loss in 2014, he loses ambulation. And post ambulation, you can see that the bulk of his, his uh, uh, thigh muscles are devoid of, of almost all cell, all muscle tissue. So what happened since the 1800s? Well, since the 1800s, uh, the most significant advancement has been the cloning of the DMD gene. Uh, and that happened in 1986, around the same time that gene therapists were organizing to establish vectors that would be useful for delivering corrected genes, as, as Don talked about. And uh, so these two fields progressed in parallel uh, with basic biology leading to understanding of the mechanism of uh, cell and molecular basis of the disease, and ultimately resulting likely on next month in the approval, first approval of a gene therapy for Duchenne. There was an advisory committee uh, meeting just two weeks ago, and the word has come down that the FDA is likely to approve it for at least four to five-year-olds. So that's an exciting development. So what's the biology here? Well, 
the DMD gene encodes the dystrophin protein, and that protein functions to provide stability to the muscle membrane in the context of contraction. So what it is is a protein that can anchor itself to the actin side of skeleton and part of the, become part of the dystrophin-associated glycoprotein complex that spans the membrane and associates uh, with the extracellular uh, matrix proteins. And so in that regard, it sort of functions as a shock absorber. When the muscle contracts, it provides stability to the membrane. And when it's gone, the muscles are fragile and uh, the, the myofiber is damaged. Uh, muscles have their own stem cells called satellite cells. And so when the membrane is damaged, it sends a signal to try to repair the muscle. But you can see the repeated damage in, in Duchenne does not lead to normal repair. And it leads also to continuous destruction of, of the muscle. So here we have a, a slide showing you in cross section. So if you go back here and you cut the muscle this way and look at it on face, you can see that the dystrophin rims most every myofiber. And uh, well, it does every myofiber. And that, you know, by light microscopy, you see that it's a nicely organized group of muscles. In DMD, you have no dystrophin expression. And you can begin to see now the fibro fatty replacement and the immune infiltrate uh, disrupting the muscle tissue. There's an interesting experiment of nature where some individuals with DMD mutations were able to make some amount of protein, not a completely functional protein, but enough to make them milder than the typical Duchenne. So the typical Duchenne has no dystrophin, and these Beckers have truncated forms of dystrophin with partial functionality. So along came the gene therapist with their first candidate for ideally delivering these AAV, uh, delivering these, these types of genes systemically. And it's an AAV vector. It's based on a, an adeno-associated virus that has uh, DNA encoding uh, uh, encapsulated in uh, uh, vector in, in, in AAV capsid proteins. And the idea here is to swap out the viral genes that are essential for the viral activity, virus's activity, and, and to put instead in uh, the missing gene. In this case, that would be dystrophin and put it into this viral shell, pack it in, and then infect individuals with the virus and hope that it's transmitted into their muscles and leads to uh, replacement of the gene. Well, that was all well and good, but as it turns out, the DMD gene is our biggest gene. And these AA vec v vectors can only take a, a much shorter, these are 14 kilobases, and, and then the vectors can only accommodate uh, a smaller genome. And so the challenge became, how do we truncate this dystrophin in a way that it could be functional, but still fit into the viral vector? And this was informed by um, some of these Becker patients that uh, make highly functional shortened dystrophins. So here you can see the full length dystrophin, the essential things is that it associates with the dystrophin, glyco dystrophin glycoprotein complex so that it can bind to the extracellular matrix. And then over here to the actin cytoskeleton so it can tether itself to the actin cytoskeleton and together function uh, to stabilize the membrane. So along the way, uh, there was a patient who was a, BM, a, a Becker muscular dystrophy patient who, who had a mutation that allowed him to express a form of dystrophin, but it was internally truncated. In fact, half of the dystrophin gene almost was gone, yet this man was still ambulatory at 61. And so companies and basic researchers set out to identify which domains were essential and which could be done without to at least make a more mild disease. And you can see that as, as time went on, more and more patients were identified with different deletions, largely though in these middle portions. And um, the MDX mouse came along, which is the mouse model. And we were able, the, the field was able to make constructs 
for the AAV microdystrophin that were shortened and that contained what they thought were the, the, the important domains. And they could test that now in the MDX model, both as a transgene or as an AAV microdystrophin gene to see whether or not they could restore function. And in fact, in these mouse models, the truncated dystrophin could restore function. So there were, in 2018, three different companies in this space. They have different viral vectors. They have different viral vectors, and they also have different uh, microdystrophin genes. They're pretty similar in terms of everybody agrees that that the central area here is dispensable. There's a few differences between the products. And I'm going to tell you today about Sarepta's product because it's the one that's anticipated to be approved first, uh, just next month. So this is the first report of the first four patients treated with uh, microdystrophin gene therapy. And it's remarkable that they express high levels of uh, dystrophin. You can see that before, this is a normal, and then the, each of the Duchenne patients don't express any dystrophin, as you would expect. And then 12 weeks after treatment, these boys were had their muscles biopsied and stained for expression of dystrophin. And I was astounded. It, it, it's high levels of microdystrophin expressed in each of these patients determined either by immunofluorescence or even by Western blot. You could see that they were highly expressed and they were the expected size. So what happened to these boys as we followed them? Well, four years out, these are boys are now four years out, and you can see that if you do a functional assessment on them, that over time, unlike the natural history control that declines over a four-year period, the boys who had received the microdystrophin gene therapy improved and stabilized. And here you can see each of these patients. Some of them lost a little bit of function over time, but they would have been predicted to have huge declines. In, in their function when in fact, uh, each of these four patients did significantly better. And so since they had the, bio, the dystrophin expression and they had such a nice result in this very limited number of boys, that allowed them to validate microdystrophin as a biomarker reasonably likely to predict clinical gain. And that enabled them to use an accelerated approval pathway. So looking at this data, it seems most likely that expression of dystrophin, microdystrophin, is responsible for this clinical gain. And that allowed them to do additional studies. They didn't sit on their heels while they were waiting for uh, those boys to get to the four-year mark. Rather, they started other studies involving other individuals and uh, were able to do an integrated analysis early on. The studies weren't complete, but after one year, they were able to show that there was a decline, uh, a, a, an increase in functionality with those who were dosed with the gene therapy product. And likewise, not surprisingly, they all expressed reasonable levels of dystrophin, microdystrophin biomarker. So these data are what the advisory committee was shown and uh, voted to support the accelerated approval of dystrophin based on dystrophin as a biomarker at 12 weeks. So that's very exciting. We anticipate that boys will start commercial dosing in the next months. And uh, that, uh, you know, we hope to see continued success in these boys. One question that's out there is how long will it last? It's predicted it will dilute with continuous cycles of degeneration and regeneration. And there's also the potential for the immune response to recognize this as foreign. In most of these patients, the drug has been saved, but in Sarepta's case, there is one patient in particular that did not do all right. He had an immune mediated myositis. Uh, it presented four weeks after injection of, of the gene therapy drug. And uh, it was scary. You know, he, he, he lost muscle uh, strength just acutely over this time. And uh, he was treated as best as they could. And uh, he's, you know, recovered to some degree. Uh, but the idea is that the immune response probably saw the transgene as foreign 
in fact, it's turning out that boys that have mutations in a particular region of the protein uh, are particularly at high risk for this immune myositis because for whatever reason, the T cells are not tolerant to, to that part of the, of the novel transgene. So this requires me to tell you a little about immunity in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And uh, what I haven't told you yet so far is I said that, you know, the, the muscle is damaged. And uh, what happens is the immune response uh, it, uh, infiltrates the muscle, the damaged muscle, and begins to coordinate the repair of the muscle. You know, we're all very fortunate that we can regenerate our muscles because we have these stem cells capable of doing that. But it has to happen in a very ordered way. First, you recruit these inflammatory immune cells. And then over time, you bring in anti-inflammatory immune cells and resolving immune cells, ultimately leading to, to uh, tissue regeneration and resolution of the wound. And so the ordering is really very important. So I like to say that muscle regeneration is like a, a ballet in three acts. Uh, at the beginning, you start with some sort of inflammatory highlight, as time goes on throughout act two, you might develop the story in an ordered way with new dancers at each point until ultimately you have resolved the wound. So if, 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 D, if normal muscle development is a ballet, DMD is a mosh, mosh pit. Rather than first having this inflammatory response and then moving on to the second and third phases, as soon as they try and get to the second and third phases, an adjacent area of the muscle is being damaged again. And so rather than being able to progress one, two, and finish the story, you end up with persistent inflammation, persistent damage, and the development of fat and fibrosis in place of muscle. So we in my lab and together with Stan Nelson group, are very interested in, in assessing what are the, the composition, what is the composition of the immune infiltrate and the fibroblasts. There's more than 40 different populations that re are remodeled uh, in order to, to repair a muscle. So we've developed a program re over the last few years where we could do a relatively non-invasive biopsy that allows us to isolate nuclei from the frozen tissue, and then every single cell nucleus we sequence on an individual basis. And that gives us hints as to the character of each cell and what their vulnerabilities are. So this is an example of the type of data we're seeing. At this point, we've done 200,000 nuclear transcriptomes. And what you can see is that, you know, these little hints in sequencing can tell you, oh, this is a myofiber. All these cells over here are myofibers. These are, are myeloid cells. These are fibroblasts. And we can track their, their expression of, uh, of genes that tell us about their character. We can also track uh, their population dynamics. So you can see that over time, the myofibers decrease uh, and uh, the satellite cells try to repair, so they expand. There's all these other cell populations involved and they need to be reordered in order to uh, allow for proper repair. So what are the immune considerations that are now pressing and that we are interested in addressing using these single cell technologies? Well, one is how long will the dystrophin pro microdystrophin protein la uh, last? But the other is, you know, just when you add back the dystrophin alone, is that sufficient to reverse all of the immune dysfunction? You know, can you enter that mosh pit and get them to go back to the order of the ballet? Or will the dystrophin protein be seen as foreign in an inflamed DMD tissue and lead to clearance of the response? Will immune responses to capsid and microdystrophin transgenes prevent redosing? It's thought that you're going to need redosing, and we know that there's an immune response to these that will be sufficiently large that when you try to redose it, it will block the infection from even happening and perhaps clear the transgene with great speed. Uh, 
So what we'd really like to know is can we capitalize on the healing environment to lead to immune tolerance? And can we find uh, combinations of immunotherapeutics or um, other solutions to mitigate these adverse events due to the transgene response? And so then my last slide is here. And it's just to tell you that this is a story that is uh, the beginning of a very rapidly expanding landscape. You can see here projection, market projections uh, between 2017 to 2024, you're expected to have you know, 31 different AAV mediated gene therapies. This is looking at it a different way, just showing you the number of companies that have entered the gene therapy space, whether it's for Duchenne muscular dystrophy or other disease indications. And as they move inward, they move through clinical trial and ultimately to uh, marketing. And you can see that just between 2019 and 2020, the, the field has gotten much more crowded. And that's largely based on the success of these early gene therapy studies. So with that, I will thank you and uh, let the next speaker go. Thank you so much, Dr. Maselli. And, and uh, I would love to just congratulate you and the entire community on moving uh, this exciting treatment into, into clinic. Um, and so uh, finally, I uh, am excited to introduce to you our last speaker, uh, Dr. Mireille Camariza. Uh, here at UCLA, we have actually a lot of faculty who have affiliations or joint appointments or deep collaborations in the Division of Life Sciences and across the campus. Uh, the work on their home department and in life sciences really allows us to bridge the critical space between research and the clinic. And Dr. Camariza is a fantastic example of this. Um, she is an assistant professor in the Department of Bioengineering at UCLA and is affiliated with the Division of, the life, of life Sciences. She's a chemical biologist with expertise building diagnostic tools for infectious pathogens. Uh, she was previously a junior fellow at the Society of Fellows at Harvard University. And prior to her appointment at Harvard, she completed her doctoral studies in biology at Stanford University, where she developed a new diagnostic technology for the rapid and simple detection of tuberculosis at the point of care. Uh, this project was awarded a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant to test their diagnostic devices in places with high levels of disease, uh, including Johannesburg in South Africa. Uh, and in addition to this work, she partnered with the African Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infections Diseases to implement CRISPR-Cas13 diagnostic testing in uh, Nigeria, which may enable routine surveillance of infectious outbreaks in the region. Her work is translated into a public benefit corporation and as co-founder of Olilux Biosciences, a company dedicated to providing low cost and portable and reliable diagnostic devices in low resource settings, she continues to serve underserved and underrepresented populations. Uh, Dr. Camarisa's lab consists of research at the intersection of chemistry and biology and molecular engineering that unlocks new possibilities for research, diagnostics, therapeutics, and precision medicine in resource constrained environments. And we are absolutely delighted um, that Dr. Camariza has joined UCLA. She's a relatively new faculty member here. Um, and we're even more excited that she is a member of our life sciences community. So over to you, Dr. Camariza, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for the kind introduction. Um, just bear with me as I try to connect my PowerPoint slide. There you go. All right. As Dr. Johnson mentioned, I, I have a, a substantial background in diagnostic development, um, particularly in the world of tuberculosis, as you will see in about a minute, uh, as well as in the world of CRISPR. I've developed uh, diagnostic assays for Ebola, LSA virus, and I'm working on malaria and many other uh, infectious pathogens. And I primarily focus on infectious diseases and, and I work 
on building molecular technologies that can be directly implemented um, in the field somewhat rapidly so that we can gain an, a, a perspective on other applications um, locally. So for today, given that there are constraints on time, I'll focus primarily on the on my work on tuberculosis, and I'll tell a little bit about some of the probes that we've done and and how we've implemented um, these probes uh, in in sub-Saharan Africa, and 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 some of the results that we've gotten from there. So just to orient you a little bit about tuberculosis, um, tuberculosis has been a global threat for centuries and, and you know, prior to the pandemic, tuberculosis or TB was the leading infectious killer caused by a single pathogen. Um, everybody now is now primed with the sort of the importance of, of managing infectious uh, diseases that can be easily transmitted uh, you know, across people. So similar to COVID-19, uh, tuberculosis is transmitted from human to human with these aerosol droplets, which makes, it, which makes tuberculosis easily um, uh, transmissible and, and can create outbreaks in many regions of the world. So I hope you can appreciate on this slide that even though TB has been somewhat eradicated in, in um, high income countries, that there is a substantial, substantially high prevalence of tuberculosis still ongoing in low and middle income countries. And in particular, one of the main reasons why we haven't been able to completely eliminate TB from, from the world has been because there, there's just a limited availability of, of powerful and, and uh, um, eff uh, uh, effective diagnostic technologies. So in particular, a diagnosis of a multi-drug resistant um, or other type of drug resistant TB is incredibly lengthy, complex, and expensive. And you know, this is a, a disease that has evolved with us and it has evolved you know, to combat some of the therapeutics that we've um, developed during the 20th century. So um, as we begin to understand how we can quickly detect um, which, which patients have drug susceptible or drug resistant uh, TB, that's how we can manage to be, start beginning to manage the disease, even in low resource environments. So really poor diagnostics and treatment adherence lead to patients um, to catastrophic costs as a result of TB disease, not just in, in high income countries, but also in low resource countries where already the resources are very limited. So this has led to many programs and in, 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 in the world of global health that to try to uh, understand and tackle this problem so we can manage TB, um, TB spread. Uh, and however, the, the pandemic has sort of th thrown a wrench in those plans. So between the, here are just some slides, um, some facts that uh, of what has happened in the world of TB, uh, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. So for instance, you know, this is uh, Dr. Kasaiva, uh, who is the director of the WHO's Global TB program, who was sort of presenting the, the impact of uh, the pandemic in the world of TB. When you imagine, you know, when everything was shutting down and, and there, were, there were a lot of uh, PPE required, you know, we were all now wearing masks and all the infections, these specialists were now working to, to tackle COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, the, those resources were primarily used and implemented for to control for TB. So as these resources were moving away to manage the, the rising um, SARS-CoV-2 infections, TB patients and TB programs were left behind. And so as a result, um, TB incidence has risen by three and a half percent ever since the, the pandemic in 2020. Um, and reversing incremental declines that we had been observing in the world of TB for the past 20 years. Specifically, uh, drug-resistant TB rose by 3% and is getting more and more expensive to treat, particularly because patients just do not have access to um, clinical um, facilities that were dedicated to TB in the past, but are now entirely dedicated to COVID-19. 
there has been an increase in, in number of deaths, um, as well as in, in uh, um, which has reserved, uh, reversed a decline in mortality that started in 2005. So really, there is if there was an urgent need for rapid diagnostics before the pandemic, now it's, it's very dire that we provide these new technologies that can rapidly detect whether um, drug susceptible or drug resistant TB diagnostics, particularly at the point of care. And this is where my work uh, sits and focuses on. So just to give you a little a brief overview of what causes tuberculosis. Here is a, a cartoon um, image of uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the bacteria that causes tuberculosis. And uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, or MTB, is a rod-shaped bacteria that is covered in a thick waxy cell surface. And this surface often called the mycomembrane um, because it's composed of these very hydrophobic mycolic acids um, is a, creates a highly hydrophobic environment and is particularly important for pathogenesis as people get um, inhale these aerosol droplets with MTB in them. Um, the, the cell surface mycomembrane is what helps the cells adhere to our into our lungs, into the deep, um, deep cavities of our lungs, and then infiltrate and, and um, infect our cells, our human cells. So as a result of this, the studying the biochemistry of the MTB cell surface is a rich area of research, including tool development to study the mycomembrane. So um, Several molecules had been developed to probe the mycomembrane using, you know, barothogonal chemistry, which is a, a chemical tool that recently won the Nobel Prize last year. And that has enabled us chemists to probe how the, the metabolic activities in bacteria and many other types of organisms. And just to briefly give you a, an idea here, the, the, the you know, biorthogonal chemistry is the idea to take a molecule that is a natural component of the mycomembrane, so say a sugar or a lipid. And you chemically modify it with a handle that once inserted into the organism will selectively interact with a complementary reporter of molecule of choice without disturbing the biological system. Um, and so this had been done in the world of TB where you can install this sugar uh, called trihalose, um, uh, which is a sugar component of the mycomembrane. And they can be decorated with a particular molecule of interest, uh, like an azide group, and fed into mycobacterium tuberculosis. And so once this sugar gets installed onto the cell surface, the, the, this azide modified trihalose would selectively interact with a secondary uh, cyclooctime molecule that is decorated with a fluorescence uh, reporter. Um, and it will interact in the barothogonal reaction step, meaning it will not disturb any of the ongoing metabolic activity in the bacterial cell. So after washing away unreacted cyclooctane probes, then the now fluorescently labeled cells are detected on the uh, fluorescence microscope, as you can see here in these images. So this clever setup was useful for research purposes. So Force, uh, and, but uh, also, and indeed was already used for uh, probing cell surface molecular dynamics. And um, But for me personally, my eye moved towards uh, leveraging the system for direct applications into the clinics, particularly in diagnostics um, at the point of care. So my idea was um, if we had a trihalose probe whose fluorescence signal is specifically activated by metabolic incorporation to the mycomembrane, then it will overcome such a limitation. So here uh, we settled on a wide variety of, of molecules that have this particular um, um, feature. The idea is that you know, these, these class of molecules remain non-fluorescent in a particular environment, and then they become highly fluorescent in in a different environment. And we knew that the mycobacterium tuberculosis had this very hydrophobic cell surface layer. And so we landed on DMN, which is a molecule that is dark in um, aqueous solutions, but then it becomes highly fluorescent in hydrophobic environment. So the idea is essentially to put DMN onto the trihalose sugar. And while it's outside of the cell, it would remain dark. And gets in you know, as it gets recognized and goes through the the regular metabolic um, 
pathway for the trihalose um, um, metabolic activity. It gets modulated and inserted into the cell surface, at which point then the DMN would turn green. And so if this were to be true, then the idea is that you could use the DMN trihalose as a potential biomarker for viability for these cells. So after we designed the DM entry synthesis um, and did a bunch of quality control assays that I won't bore you with today, um, we decided to test it directly in bacteria. And just to, again, to show you the simplicity of this system, we have this DM entry Hillis reagent, you, and then you just put a drop of that onto a culture of bacteria, for instance, Mycobacterium um, tuberculosis or Mycobacterium smegmatis. Uh, and you incubate for some time, and then you just directly image under the microscope. And so you get an image like this, uh, where these are cells, these are mycobacterium smegmatis cells that we tested in this particular experiment. And then here, these cells are swimming in, um, in a buffer containing our DMN trihalose. And what you can appreciate in this image is that only the cells are ingested inside the, only the, the probes are ingested inside the cells are fluorescent. And none of the dyes that are outside of the cells are fluorescent. Um, if we were to follow a similar procedure with already existing cells, this is what you, uh, already existing probes, this is what you would see. So these are already um, published literature that are based probes. And even if you use um, uh, existing smear uh, reagents for TB diagnostics today, this is, you will see a similar uh, image where you get overwhelmed by unincorporated probes that are in your system. Um, and so this was, you know, this was really exciting to us because pres presumably DMN trihalose could, in principle, be following a simple protocol to detect these mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, so I wanted to test, well, if they require metabolic um, activity, then could, presumably we could also detect whether they would respond to drug, drug treatment. So here I had some cells where I incubated them with some, um, with some cocktail that is currently being administered to TB patients. And then I did my following protocol where I added the DMN trihalose, I incubated for some time, and I did the imaging. So I hope you can appreciate here that is that when cells are, are not exposed to drugs, you can label them quite um, easily. But when they're exposed to a drug cocktail, they are no longer, they no longer have the ability to get labeled with the DMN trihalose, suggesting that we could potentially um, use this to, de to determine whether a, a cell is uh, drug susceptible. But what if a cell is a drug resistant? So to test this, I decided to use a um, isoniazid susceptible or isoniazid resistance strain. And the isoniazid is one of the drugs that is given to TB patients. And then I exposed the cells to increasing concentrations of this isoniazid. And then here is just a mean fluorescence intensity measurement to uh, ascertain how well they're able to label with these probes. And what, I hope what you can appreciate here with the isoniazid susceptible strain, you're, you can see a, a, night, a net stepwise decrease in, in their ability to label with the probes. But when you have the isoniazid resistance strain, you actually don't see any changes in, in the labeling, regardless of how much drug these cells are exposed to. Um, and so this, this was really important for us because presumably we could use these probes to determine whether a patient has a drug resistance strain or not, and which drug resistance um, the patient um, is presenting. So after we did this initial, uh, all these characterization experiments, we confirmed all of the data that I've just shown you with um, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And again, just to show you how, how simple um, this process is, with TB, you have a one-step labeling procedure, and you're able to distinguish between um, drug-susceptible cells versus drug resistance. But with the currently used, um, or I mean smear, that is currently used at the, at the point of care for TB the diagnostics, you're, it's a seven-step labeling procedure, and you're not able to determine whether a person has a drug resistance strain. 
Um, so while we had all these really good attributes for this new probe, we, we envisioned then implement the, implementing this. Well, was, you know, and this probe had really good uh, features that could help us bring this to the field. So you already used existing equipment, you needed a, a fluorescence microscope and smear, um, smear diagnostic right, right now for TBs done with smear microscopy. Um, it's a simpler, pro it's a simple protocol that can be done within a minutes. But what's really helpful with the simplicity of the protocol, it can be highly automated, so you can run many, many samples at once. And the the added feature that is in revolutionary in the world of TB is the fact that it can now report on drug efficacy. So we've done, you know, I'm going to show you a couple of examples here of some implementation data here. I went to South Africa. We collaborated with Dr. Uh, Bavesh Khanna and his student, uh, Christopher Eland, um, where we detected, we were hoping to detect mycobacterium tuberculosis patient samples. Um, these are coming from, sputum samples are coming from the lung. And so we followed a simple protocol um, that nurses today are using in, in South Africa, where you collect sputum samples from patients, you do a simple decontamination step. And then what they did is they compared between our DM entry labeling versus the standard oramine smear. And then these are some of the images that we detected um, during that experiment. And right now we have ongoing follow-up experiments with data from patient samples that are ongoing treatments to see how well we're able to tell whether patients are getting cured versus patients are getting um, drug resistance um, um, outputs. Another collaboration that we have on, ongoing is the ability, now that we have this simple protocol and this ability to do a smear test, can we detect um, mycobacterium tuberculosis in blood? And this is exactly what we did with some collaborators in Durban, South Africa, um, where they had a population of patients that are co-infected between tuberculosis and TB, um, tuberculosis and HIV. And these patients, because they're immune compromised, they're unable to provide sputum samples. And so the only way to do diagnostics for them for TB is to actually do a blood draw. And you can't, currently you can't do smear tests for blood draw. So the idea was to use our probes to see whether we would actually be able to detect intact cells um, in blood samples. And as you can appreciate in this image, we're able to readily visualize some really interesting morphology of mycobacterium tuberculosis in, in, in these patient samples that, um, from patients that have both HIV and TB. And with them too, we're doing some follow-up studies to understand, okay, how quickly can we detect uh, these cells? And are we able to monitor um, drug efficacy in these, in these blood samples as well? So I'll just quickly summarize um, the work that I've talked about today. You know, we've have these new probes and it's a whole class of probes and I've only talked about DM entry today that permit the no wash one step detection of mycobacterium tuberculosis and potentially rep report on drug susceptibility. We've demonstrated that we can now detect MTB in sputum samples from um, patients and in blood samples as well now for the first time. And potentially now that we're doing these pharmacokinetic studies, we can report on cell viability um, over the course of treatment, which potentially could uh, help us build a, a cure metric so that we know whether uh, patients are actually responding to the treatment and whether they've been cured of um, MTB cells. I didn't get to talk about this a little bit, um, but we're also working on engineering a, a, a toolkit that could fit in a backpack that you could hand to a health worker and they would walk around the streets of somewhere in India and be able to actually test patients um, outside of a clinic as well. Again, because of the simplicity of the assay itself, it can be done outside of a hospital. As Dr. Johnson mentioned, um, we've, you know, we've partnered with a, we've started, a, I'm a co-founder of a company and we've partnered with um, the Gates Foundation to provide these probes far and wide. We have many national and international partners that are testing these probes now in their clinics and the hospitals to ascertain how well these probes work for their diagnostic purposes. And I will thank you for listening and I'll stop here.
Thank you so much, um, Dr. Camariza. This is uh, it's just wonderful to see how the synergy between different disciplines can really be transformative. Um, and uh, we're just delighted to think about what the possibilities are for treating in places where resources are limited. So thank you for your work. Um, now I'd like to uh, welcome our panelists to be in conversation, Dr. Kong, Dr. Maselli, and Dr. Camariza. And we're going to address as many of your questions as possible, um, including some of the questions that were submitted by um, our audience in advance. Um, and we'll just start as a general question, because I think we're really curious about this for, for all of you. You get a sense of the really the important timeline but once you have a research that, once you have your research that you feel like is ready to go into clinical trials, can you give us a sense of what the time scale is from a fundamental discovery to a diagnostic or a clinical application? And we'll just go, go around the room. Maybe Dr. Cohn, we start with you. Okay, I'll go first. Yeah. So the the uh, gene therapy that I talked about for ADA skid, um, we saw we we were doing earlier versions, and in 2009 we said we should move to this newer type of virus, and we treated the first patient in 2013. So I guess four years, which is pretty good. Uh, we already had the, the platform and everything going, but it took that long to do the lab work to show how well it worked, to do all the applications several grant applications along the way to fund fund the work. Um, so that, that's sort of, I think, one of the fastest. Um, our, our work with sickle cell, we started doing in about 2009. We treated the first patient in our trial in 2015, so six years. So it's, it's, it's not fast. Yeah. I'll just mention that Duchenne was one of the first disease genes cloned, and so uh, the DMD gene. And so it took a bit longer. <laughs> it was a challenge. And it was upwards of 30 years, uh, 37 years between gene discovery and translation. Uh, but it has really led the way for a lot of the other rare disease, uh, diseases that are, are translating. Uh, a good example would be SMA, which mm -hmm. then had 10 years between uh, diagnostics or you know, finding the gene and, and coming up with a treatment. As far as diagnostics go, mm -hmm. that can happen quite rapidly now. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get a, a new disease gene, you can have a molecular test for that family within months. That's really powerful. Also, thinking about how work on one disease or one challenge can open the door to other types of of breakthroughs. Um, Dr. Camariza. Yeah, I will echo my colleagues, you know, I'm in the world of diagnostics, not therapeutics. For, so for us, we're not trying to put things in people, but rather get things out of people and then detect. So it was quite rapid for the work that I did on tuberculosis from, from start to finish, you know, the, the ideation and the testing in the lab started around 20, 2015 or so, and we were in South Africa by 20, 2017, 2018. So it took about two and a half, three years to get there. But um, the pandemic has shown us how quickly we can get diagnostics in people. Like we have mm -hmm. home tests that were available like within six months. Um, so I, in the world of diagnostics, it can be very rapid. Thank you for that. And, and for the reminder of, of, I think for the students who are on the, on the um, webinar, the importance of really understanding your chemistry. I'll just add that. <laughs> um, I think people are going to be really curious to hear a bit about what drew you to your research. What, what, you know, Dr. Maselli, you talked about a, working on a problem for such a long time. What draws you and what has drawn you to the area that you're studying? Well, I, I started out as an undergraduate at UCSD and worked in a cancer immunology lab where I was completely fascinated by the immune system and particularly the molecular details of how the adaptive immune response recognizes foreign antigens in response to it. So I went on to do um, a PhD at Duke in kidney allograft rejection and on to Stanford to uh, discover some of the molecular interactions involved in triggering the response. And 
I'd been at UCLA then probably for 10 or so years when in 2004, my son was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, my second son. And when we went to the clinic, my husband and I, we were very disappointed in what UCLA had to offer. It was well known at the time that, that just comprehensive care could add 10 years of life. And that wasn't available here at UCLA, one of the best universities in the world. And so we set out to change that, to develop a clinical trial infrastructure. We're now the leading clinical trial site in the country. And uh, to coerce our, our colleagues and friends into entering the field by providing them access to tools that would let those who are already in the Duchenne field move closer to translation and to pull in some who weren't focused on Duchenne to uh, apply their skills towards our problem. Thank you for sharing that incredible story. Um, Don, what about you, Dr. Cohn? Yeah, so I, I liked science since I was a kid. I had chemistry sets and used to make little fires in the basement as a kid. And then in college, I got very interested in biology. And when I, I went to medical school in my first year, I heard a lecture from someone who had been involved in the first bone marrow transplant for a boy with skid. And he was talking about that. It just seemed amazing. So I worked in his lab that summer. And that's that's how I got interested in the field. And actually, when I was a third year medical student, the first patient I had on pediatrics was one of his patients was a child with skid who came from Venezuela with BC with pneumonia from the TB vaccine, which is normally just a vaccine, but in kids with no immune system can cause an overwhelming mm -hmm. infection. So it's been it's just been it, it's interested me how incredibly strong the immune system is, like as Carrie was talking about the response to the virus that we don't want, but also the ability to protect us like from SARS-CoV-2. And uh, Dr. Camariza. Yeah, I, you know, I'm from a small country in East Africa where infectious disease is a, is a big problem. And so for me, TB, malaria, these, some of these um, forgotten disease are, are something that I wanted to do when I, when I managed to go to school and I, and I managed to get really wonderful mentors along the way that sort of guided me towards this, this field of chemistry and, and the intersection of chemistry and biology and biochemistry and molecular biology and understanding what, how we can fashion things. Um, and when I was at Stanford in particular, I, I, you know, I've met many people who sort of aligned with these sort of application focused, uh, application driven research, which is something that I was driving my, my own uh, particular grad school experience. And so I, I, that's what's driven me ever since. Um, thank you. And I think that there are some common themes around experiences and, and being really captivated by a question uh, early in your careers and, and um, mentors who guide that as well. Um, I uh, have a question now um, specifically for, for you, Carrie. And, and one, of the, um, one of the guests asked, why do only boys have the muscular uh, dystrophy um, uh, disease? and uh, not females. And there was a question of whether it was because uh, females are less likely to be homozygous for the lack of the gene of concern. But basically, what is, what is the, um, the yes, sex specific exactly feature? Right. Uh, uh, the, the DMD gene is located on the X chromosome. And uh, if you have two Xs, your good X can compensate for the bad X. If you're male, you have only one X. And so girls can get Duchenne, but they have to have mutations in both of their um, genes inherited from their parents. Whereas in the case of boys, they only need one mutant gene. So it happens with a much higher frequency. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and now we have a question from um, Justina Labib, an undergraduate uh, here at UCLA. And the question is rather uh, in, in virus mediated gene therapy of immune deficiencies, how do you select which virus to use and what characteristics do you look for in making a selection of a particular viral vector? Yeah, very, very good question. And, um, you know, so Carrie and I both talked about using viruses for genes, but different viruses. And the reason what we're trying to do is to put a gene permanently into the stem cells DNA and have it be there when the cell divides and gets passed on. So the viruses that we use are ones that do that. They get into a cell, put their DNA into the DNA of the cell. 
And those are a class of viruses called retroviruses. And actually the one that we're using most recently is based on the HIV virus. So HIV normally infects T cells and puts its DNA into the chromosome. We can take the virus genes out and just use sort of the shell of the virus to do the same thing with our gene. In Carrie's work, which you could talk about, but you know, she's trying to get the virus distributed to the whole muscle system. Much harder, we, we can take the bone marrow out and fix it in the laboratory and give it back. You can't do that with muscles. And so the virus that, that, that is being used for muscular dystrophy is one that's very good at going throughout the body and getting into many tissues. I don't care if you wanna comment on that. Yeah, it's just a bigger challenge when you have to deliver it systemically. You know, these boys are receiving 10 to the 14th viral particles per kilogram. It's a whopping dose. And, uh, you know, people have selected these vectors to be not so immunogenic, but it's a real challenge to the system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have a question now for Dr. Camariza. Why is it that the BCG vaccine is not used worldwide? That's a very good question. And the BCG vaccine is used. It's one of the only vaccines that are available out there. Um, and it is used in, in, in many countries, but the, the requirements for mandatory vaccination with the BCG is different depending on the country you're in. It's um, it, in some of the countries, it depends on like you know, TB incidents, um, just global cases and mortality rates. So in some of the more high TB burden countries, it tends to be mandatory and in some, in some other countries, maybe not. Also, I have to caveat that the BCG vaccine is very efficacious for in, in pediatric patients, but not so much in adults. So mm. it's not very productive, protective once you become an adult. Thank you. And I'm sure that there's uh, the intersection between understanding that and the immunity and the immune system. Um, we keep coming back to the important intersection of these disciplines. Um, we have a question for uh, Dr. Pacelli. What, how much of your research on the immune response uh, can be brought to bear to enable redosing AAV gene therapy for DMD down the road after a child has received an initial dose? Well, I mean, we're hopeful that we can do that. We can't do it currently. Uh, and that's in large part because we don't really understand the immune uh, milieu in the muscle and how when you do express a transgene, how it might respond. Mm -hmm. And that's a particular challenge in, in, in DMD because you already have sort of inflamed muscles to begin with, and then you're delivering you know, a virus together with a transgene. So the thought is, can we use some of the available immunosuppressants or develop novel immunosuppressants that will blunt the sort of rejection type responses that you would get if you had a second dose. There's a sufficient response to AAV that the prediction is if you tried to reduce dose somebody, the, the circulating antibodies would block the virus before it even got into the cell. Mm -hmm. And any sort of immune response to the transgene itself, if you gave another dose of it, might function sort of as a, the first round might have functioned kind of like a vaccine so that you get a better mm -hmm. response later. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the good news is that there are tons of immunomodulators out there that, uh, you know, attack different aspects of immunity. Some are tolerizing, some are anti-inflammatory. And so I feel confident that once we understand the players and how those players respond intramuscularly to the expression of the transgene and Ebola as a virus, we'll have some insight as to which drugs might best target those. Hmm. You know, I can't help but wonder, you know, one of the big challenges is that this enormous gene, and you're trying to figure out just the right um, amount of it to deliver in a virus. You know, with the advent of um, gene editing, is there a way to um, actually modify where those mutations are such that we can use CRISPR gene editing to maybe bypass the challenges of delivering these the large gene to patients? Well, certainly you can ad uh, address the issues of the gene being so large. And some of the interdisciplinary research that we facilitated here on campus has led to the development of a company that is aiming to use CRISPR-Cas mm. uh, technology to, to correct the gene. But the unfortunate news 
is that currently all of those uh, uh, all of those delivery of the CRISPR-Cas is largely dependent on the success of AAV gene therapies. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it'll follow in the slipstream with an additional challenge of CRISPR of the Cas proteins being from bacteria that many of us have already been exposed to and may have a preformed uh, immune response to. So again, I believe it'll happen, but it's not going to happen until we can figure out how to modulate the immunity. Mm. Thank you so or, much. Or find a different vector that's not mm -hmm. immunogenic. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe a nanoparticle, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I and I am sure that this is something that Dr. Camarizo thinks a lot about. That you know, we, the way we are developing better nanoparticles, maybe to uh, act as delivery systems. Again, as the interface between the chemistry and the biology, the therapeutics, the diagnostics. It's very exciting. Um, speaking of exciting, we'll conclude with two questions that uh, came in earlier. If you think about, you know, what's exciting on the horizon where either your research or kind of the big picture of where um, Bench to uh, Bedside research is going, what gets you excited? And I just open it up to, to everyone. Well, I'm excited about the possibility of replacing genes with functional copies and the reality that more and more companies are entering this space and more and more children are being dosed with these drugs. And I think that the advances are just going to come much more quickly. So I find that really exciting. Yeah, I think I heard recently there is, is it 1,100 INDs open, some very large number of studies going on around the country in the gene therapy, cell therapy space. So there is a lot, the FDA is trying to cope with the, the volume of work that's going on. So it's really the fruit of you know, decades of research that we have these capabilities. Uh, one, of, one of the things that, I, that I'm very excited about is sort of CRISPR 2.0. So the original CRISPR that, as described is an enzyme that cuts DNA and then you can get some repair of that. There are now things like called base editors where you can actually go in and out of the whole genome of 3 billion bases, change one to fix a specific mutation. So the tools are getting more refined and, and precise. And so and there, there are many other iterations of, of gene editing technology that will really allow us to really very precisely correct many genetic diseases with a caveat, as Carrie said, of delivery is really the challenge. Things like cystic fibrosis that affect the airway. You know, we've had the gene for 20, 30 years, but how you get it normal copies or, or CRISPR into the airways is really the challenge. And so it's, there's, there's still a lot to be done. You know, the challenge with muscle is it's 40% of our body is muscle. It's huge. Mm -hmm. So the target is, is, is very big. So you're going to need mm -hmm. a lot of delivery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Camarizo, what excites you? Yeah, I, you know, I have been so inspired by the work that was done during the pandemic the, you know, coronavirus, you know, SARS-CoV-2 was a virus and a lot of the lessons that we've learned in terms of diagnostics, therapeutics, um, of, how, of how these coronaviruses work could be implemented in other types of viruses. Hmm. You know, I, I worked in, in the space of Ebola virus and Lassa virus and West now Zika virus and Dagen virus. And, and a lot of the, 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 the molecules and for therapeutic drug development and the vaccine development all of those things could be lessons learned for these other more uh, similarly infectious uh, viruses. But not just there. The mRNA vaccine has now been tested for TB and malaria. There is a vaccine in development for those two as well. And again, these are lessons that we've learned during the pandemic. The pandemic. And so I've been I'm incredibly, incredibly excited to see what the future holds for infectious disease. And um, yeah, thank you for that reminder that, you know, we heard, we learned a lot of lessons. Some were not such good lessons that we learned over the course of the pandemic, but I think the way the scientific community came together to really think about how to, um, you know, have impact uh, is really inspiring. So, so thank you. Um, and, uh, and maybe a final question. Um, we still have some, quite a few of our students who are here who are interested in maybe hearing how a student at UCLA or students in general might get in, interested and in, in have access to uh, laboratory research, maybe 
how do, how do students get involved in research at UCLA or in general? Volunteer. <laughs> so work in a lab, get units or, or you know, work study student, volunteer, but, you know, get yourself into a lab. And if you're interested in dystrophy, I recommend one of the dystrophy labs on campus, including my own. You know, we could use a lot of, of skills. We've had a lot of undergraduates in the lab before. Yeah, I mean, there, there are literally hundreds of great labs on campus. And I, I think, you know, many of them, they, they can only take a, a limited number of students. So I think a student has to be very proactive and contact many labs and find the one that, you know, just had a spot open up. We, we had an undergraduate in our lab. She joined us in her senior year and stuck around for two years before she went to medical school, started a whole new project and got a paper out in, in that, that period. So cer certainly, and she, she really started a new area in the laboratory. So students make a big difference for the research. It's one of the great things about being at UCLA is we have brilliant students here. I concur. Dr. Camariza. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> uh, yeah, I echo what everything that has been said. I think volunteering is a good aspect. Some, there are programs too. There are undergraduate research programs that can help students find the mentors to do research. Um, but yeah, because of the limited lab availability of lab space, I think just emailing some faculty that you're interested in working with and asking them if they have a spot, it's probably a good way to go. And we are fortunate to have an undergraduate research center that is uh, really focused on trying to connect students with research opportunities. We have biomedical research minor where there are students who get connected. So I think at UCLA, that's one of the things that we all concur is really important that our students have access to the best quality education and research is an important part of that. Um, but I think one of the things that's very clear from our conversation this evening is that UCLA is a place where extraordinary research happens. And so I want to just express my gratitude to the three of you for the beautiful work that you do, the impact that you have in the at UCLA and, and in the broader biomedical research community. And uh, I'm just really excited to have you as colleagues here at UCLA. So um, with that, I hope you all, everyone in our audience enjoyed uh, the evening and maybe learned something that you will take with you. Uh, as a reminder, the webinar has been recorded and we will send a post-event email with the link to the recording. And please feel free to uh, share it with others. And we hope that you'll be able to join us again for our Let's Talk Science event. Uh, please keep an eye out for invitations that come from UCLA Life Sciences. This is something that's really important to us to be able to be in conversation with, uh, with our community to, to really advertise and celebrate the great work that's happening here at UCLA in Life Sciences. So thank you again for joining us tonight and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.